Five minutes, five minutes past one now. Uh, Lauren Wood's written a terrific piece in today's Herald Sun. Unity in time of misery. It's a focus and a feature on Bree Davey, the captain of the Carlton AFLW team. Tough 2017 for Bree Davey, 2018 for Bree Davey. Hoping the 2019 is going to be a whole lot better. Uh, lovely to see you in here. Thanks for coming in for a chat. Yeah, thanks, Andy. I'm pumped to be here. It's good to have you. Um, how are you? coming back you play the first couple I keep thinking it's last year but it was earlier this year of course you play the first couple this year last season do the knee terrible setback for you and the team how's the rehab coming along yeah look it's going really well at the moment I'm about nine months post op now so um, the start was quite slow um, and tough the first few months really tough but um the back end now sort of caught up and I'm, I'm where I need to be and sort of hitting those sort of little milestones. So I've got to keep obviously doing that up until round one, hopefully. And yeah. if I tick them all off and, and get them all right, I should be right to go. So that's that's the hope anyway. You say hopefully round one. It, do, you, do you need to put a target in front of you? Are you one of those people that, okay, I'm going to set myself for that and I can work back from that? Or are you a bit more – can you afford to be a bit more patient than that? Yeah, look, I'm – it really depends on my mindset on yeah, the day, yeah. and it could change day to day. But um, for me, over the whole sort of knee rehab, it's such a long, tedious um, sort of process. And I think if I had to stress myself out too much about looking at, you know, a potential round one play, playing in the round one, I probably would have, you know, done my head in a little bit. So for me, um, it was just about getting every single day right. And, you know, whether it's in the gym, get doing my strength or my running or my agility work, um, sort of just taking each day as it comes and, and ticking off those milestones and, I think for me, um, if I'm doing those things and everything I can do um, within my power, I think I won't be disappointed if I, you know, if I was potentially to miss round one, obviously. Yeah, sure. But yep, um, yep. if I know that I've done everything I can in my power, there's not much else I can do. Nature takes over after that, yeah, doesn't it? That's it? Have you ever done one before? No, so this is my first knee. Any other major you know, injuries that you've had that have kept you away from either of your sports for a while? Yeah, I have I have had um, my fair run of injuries, but um, probably my other sort of one that kept me out for a while was I had a duct tendinopathy, so it's a groin injury. Right. Um, it's a bit of a bug. It's similar to osteitis pubis for people who, are sim- who sort of know about that sort of thing. But um, yeah, I was probably out of the out of training and stuff for about eight months. So it's still pretty long. Um, but this is a whole, the knee, it's just a whole new game, a whole new ballpark really, I think. So how do you go with it? You mentioned that, that, that whenever you hear, talk to anyone about the rehab, there's a lot of it that is tedious and boring and small steps, real small step kind of stuff to get yourself yeah. back to you know where you're at now. You're joining foolish training and doing all the running now. Are you good at the early stuff when it is just baby steps to begin with? Um, I, d- I actually didn't think I was when I, when I did my knee. That's what I started to stress about. I was like, oh, here we go. I've got that rehab stuff to do again. And like I said, with my, with my adductor tendinopathy, with my groins earlier, yeah, yeah, it was yeah. about probably about four years ago now. Um, it was hard. It was so hard. And I thought, oh, I might struggle here to do it. But, um, you know, I've got such a great support system around me, which I think really pushed me, being my family, um, obviously my partner Tilly yeah. and um, my teammates, my amazing teammates and the amazing, um, you know, uh, med- medical stuff we've got there with Riley, our, our physio and stuff like that. So without those guys, really, I definitely wouldn't be sort of at the point I'm at at the moment and mentally as well, I feel really good. So. Tell us about the network of other players around the AFLW system, particularly here in Victoria, who are similarly going through knee rehabs after last year. There's a part of Lauren's story that you talk about that, yep. but I'd be interested to actually hear you tell a story about you know Hickey and Huntington and yeah, you and yep. the communication that you've had between one another and how that's kind of helped. Yeah, so there's been a fair few of us, as you've probably seen in the papers and everything written up, who have done our knees. So, um, yeah, obviously Mel had um, had a lot to do at the moment with Mel Hickey and um, Izzy Huntington as well. Obviously, they've gone through their second knee. So, for me, it was really sort of... Um, important to touch base with them and and maybe learn some things from them even though I guess every rehab is different yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah we also had Sarah Lampard from uh, Melbourne Ainsley Kemp as well who both had done their um, their knees too so there was sort of a little group of us um, who yeah we, we caught up a couple of times and sort of just touched base on where we're all at and, and gave each other maybe some feedback or some you know um, maybe just some words of advice but um, yeah it was it was awesome and that was sort of driven I sort of mentioned it in the in the article that was written, but um, it was sort of really driven by Mel Hickey, um, and so she's been incredible. I think again for someone who's going through it twice, I think she sort of understands probably what we're about to go through yeah, being first timers. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, she's awesome. Yeah, she's terrific. Tell us about the um, 
the ACL prevention work that you do um, at before training, after all the things that you're doing, because it, you know we understand now the physiology of women, you're more prone yeah. um, to suffer ACL injuries than you know than men. Um, tell us about the work that you have to do before you even think about running out on the track to do some actual footy training. Yeah, well, it's to be honest, there's a lot of work spent on that. I mean, the um, we've obviously got our sports science staff come through, and there's a real focus around it because, as as you mentioned, we're obviously twice as likely or with us even more higher stat um, how much more likely we are to do it. So, um, yeah, we spend probably about 15 minutes within our sort of warm-up period just on pure sort of knee prevention sort of exercises and um, just to get us us firing before we head out onto the field to make sure that we're not putting ourselves at risk. So um, I know the boys' men's program would be doing it as well, but obviously, um, you know, for us it's it's – because we're in our infancy stages of the league as well, we're so probably seeing a few more knees than the boys as well. How far has it come in a short period of time? It's version three of AFLW. It is infant stages, but we see you know, the, the calibre of young players coming into the league, and we'll talk to you about that on the way through, but they're, they're unbelievably impressive. So we're starting to see real evolution in terms of um, the young players and their capabilities coming in. But in terms of support staff, um, the physical preparation ha- has it changed, you know, dramatically in a short period, short period of time. Yeah, I think so. I mean, you go back to the first year, and most girls coming through into the first season had never sort of, I guess, had a taste of an elite environment. So going into the gym a few times a week and being on the track and running those conditioning sessions and you know, to really intense um, sort of efforts. Yeah. Um, they probably weren't as used to it. So their bodies and stuff probably reacted probably poorly in that first season, well, initially anyway, um, just because they were just getting smashed what they're probably not oh. used to. And, and the gym and the gym stuff, some girls didn't, you know, sort of know how to even do maybe a squat or something quite, you know, that people or other elite athletes are just so used to. It's mm. second nature to them. So um, I think from that aspect, we've seen massive improvements. Girls, obviously, the bodies are getting used to it, um, but not just that. I think um, in terms of that sort of elite mindset, that's definitely come along as well over the last few years. And we're obviously seeing a big difference on field um, with, you know, I think the first year girls were averaging maybe 7Ks or something, and then the second year it bumped up to 11 or something like that. Yeah. that that's not probably well, as just, accurate. The but. difference in your in your group's, 2k time trial results in terms of what was the benchmark speed yep. from two years ago compared to the numbers that were being produced at the start of your training session this year. Yeah. The, the the fastest girl from two years ago compared to this year, it's they've knocked a minute off yeah. the, the the quickest time that was being produced in the group. That's unbelievable. Yeah, it's incredible, and I think the average is obviously increased amazingly as well. I think we're most of the most of the girls were getting between sort of eight thirty between nine eight eight thirty and nine, some even into the nine thirty tens in the first season. And now all of a sudden, um, you know, girls are running and really pushing that low seven sort of or you know, mid seven sort oh, of mark as well. Absolutely. So um yeah, it's definitely made us all have to really sort of pull our finger out with the running yeah. stuff and really make sure we're getting that conditioning done. Yeah. So, so all the stuff we're talking about, the back room support that you've got exposure to now and imagine what you've got down at Car has been, you know, replicated it, you know, hopefully at all AFLW programs around the country. Is this similar to the stuff that you had available to you when you were playing W League and Matilda's football? Yeah, I mean... Or is it even a step up from what you had? Or is Yeah, it initially, yeah. it definitely was. It's been a step up initially, definitely. So first, probably, W League has been around now probably for about 12, I'd say 12 years. Yeah. That's a, a punt, but it's, it's around that. Yeah, around that. Um, but yeah, that I was involved from the very start of that, so I sort of got to be part of the start of that, and now obviously the start of AFLW, which is really cool. But um, yeah, I think the difference is is pretty pretty major in the initial stages. I remember with the soccer, we probably didn't have as much resources as what the AFL have given us initially in terms of even just facilities. So the basic stuff like training on a really nice ground. So yeah. sometimes we'd be training, there'd be potholes and, you know, just dealing with little things like that. And, you know, if you cop an injury from rolling your ankle in a pothole, you're not you're not going to be too happy. So that just things like that, just little things, massive difference. Um, and definitely, I think now, obviously, 12 years in, they're probably at the same level, if not probably got their self sorted a little yeah. bit more. But the AFL initially, as I said, we started off great. And I think, you know, we'll probably, hopefully, we set, a standard for every other women's comp. And you're not stupid. Like, you, 
people say we want this to be an elite competition, right? We want it to be elite. Well, you can tell if... Okay, that's what people are saying, but look what they're dishing up. They're dishing up substandard change rooms where we're being booted off the main venues. We're training on outdoor facilities and, in, and where there's nights falling with bad lights and um, dodgy surfaces. It's hard to live the aspiration of those who are laying the foundation out for these things. They, they want to sell it to be this elite you know, product, competition, I should say. Yeah. Um, it's hard for you guys to buy into that if that's not being delivered to you when you turn up to train and when you turn up on game day. And the clearly what you're experiencing at Carlton now is very much an elite program and facility that's being provided. Yeah, oh, definitely. And that's and that's what I was meaning about those small things. Yeah, Get absolutely. those things right yeah, and, yeah. and the girls are happy. I mean, we haven't been used to being on, you know, sort of massive salaries, so we're not expecting to walk in straight into something like yep, that. But yep. for us, it's um, getting those small things right, having quality facilities, quality change rooms, you know, the ice baths, the, you know, the recovery sort of things, um, just all things like that, um, which Colton have really nailed. Um, and obviously things like pay and stuff will, will hopefully come a bit more in the yeah, future. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Well, yeah, let, that, hopefully it does. Yes. Hopefully it comes yeah, sooner. Yeah. Hopefully it comes yeah, sooner. Because yeah. like, you're putting in. I mean, yeah, this is yeah. the thing that critics of the caper, and you know they're out there, oh, they are diminishing, I think, thankfully. But that the time, effort, um, and intensity that you guys are putting in yeah. through a long pre-season to yeah. get yourself ready for a short competition season, it actually if I can editorialise here, it does deserve to be recompensed. Yeah, it does deserve, yeah, yeah. you do deserve more. Yeah, you know? definitely. And I think, for, I mean, for me, I've had a question pop up a few times around, you know, whether um, I think the women's standards at the men's or if, if we should be paid equally. And to me, I know it is a bit of an eye roll oh, sometimes. because it just, just is, bro. It yeah, must do your it's, head it's, in. It's, exactly. What a smash a wall every time <laughs> I hear this sort of stuff. I know, I know. It's just, you know, it's a different, you have to look at them almost as different games. I mean, we, the men have had, obviously, luckily had the privilege of playing for hundreds of years, whereas we've been three years in. Mm. Um, and the how critical people are being. I mean, look, I, I'm, I'm old. I can take on feedback, get, throw it at me. But um, I just think that sometimes people are a bit naive in the fact that we've been three years in. Um, yeah, we've had yeah. women playing you know, prior, obviously, for 20-plus years, but maybe even longer, but yeah. no one's ever known about it. We've never been given an opportunity to really um, grow and sort of have an opportunity to play at an elite level. So, yeah. so you want support. And you look for it out there, for, particularly from a you know from an economic and um, corporate type. Um, you want those signs coming in that yeah, no, we are starting to get some traction um, as a sport and as a footy team. Bioglands jumped on board, signed a three year deal exclusive with the AFLW team at Carlton. When that sort of stuff happens, what does that? How does that? Val- does that sort of act as a kind of validation for you and for others that? Well, people are recognising what we're doing here. People do want to attach themselves yeah. to, to what we're about. Oh, definitely. Um, obviously, like as you mentioned, Bioglana jumped on. Um, and when you see like their commitment, so they've obviously committed to us for the next three years, yeah. it's massive. So it shows that they've got faith in us and it makes us sort of – have that belief as well that, you know, this is a good league and this is going to just continue to grow. And um, so, yeah, I mean, support by Glam. We've got MC Labor and Hyundai who have all been with us of course, yeah. pretty much since the first season. So, yeah, um, yeah they're, they're incredible. And we obviously we've got some other sponsors that will throw, throw sort of whatever they can in to help and they just want to help. And that is um, the most important thing to our skills as well. It's just incredible. Can you stick around on the other side of the break? Yeah, of oh, course. A bit more to talk to yeah. you about. Brie Davies going to stick around for a chat. The captain of the Carlton AFLW team, if you want to talk any uh, Carlton specific or AFLW general, feel free to get on the line, 9429 Brie Davies in the studio. We're just having a chat about where she's at and where the game of AFLW is as these teams are working extremely hard up to their Christmas break, then they're back in it and... It's on you pretty quickly, isn't it? Like it, once you get back from your Christmas break, and I'm not even sure how long you've got off. It's probably not yeah. more than a couple of weeks. I yeah, I think it's, we got ten days, and 10 then days, yeah. and throughout that period, as you can imagine, we're smashing ourselves with the conditioning and and sort of it's training by ourselves. Um, but we'll obviously try and connect as a group over that period. It's easier running with others. Yeah, but yeah. Um, yeah, so we've got 10 days and then we're pretty much straight into a practice match and then almost into round one. So yeah. it's it's turn the turnaround is so quick after Christmas. So that's why that 10-day break is really important for, for the girls and probably for every other team um, to make sure you're staying on top of, of what you're doing. It, it, for a whole lot of reasons, you know, your injury 
part of it. It wasn't the year that your team wanted last year, and there were some significant changes made. You've got a new GM of footy ops coming in, Nicole Grace, who's doing a super job. Tell me about the influence of Daniel Harford. Everybody around this radio station knows him well. He spent way too many years here <laughs> talking to the people on the other side of the microphone. We, yeah. we love him dearly. He's such yeah. a great friend to everybody here. But from your perspective, what sort of, in the short time that you've been with him, what sort of influence has he had around the place? Oh, he's been absolutely amazing. I mean, obviously, um, besides the obvious fresh start um, in terms of having a fresh face there and he's obviously got a fresh direction and where he wants to take the group and, and sort of what he wants to do. Um, he just brings like this really amazing balance of being able to sort of lighten the mood, but also when he needs to be serious, he just gets to business. So he's got that really, I don't, and not many people can nail that, but he really does. Um, and I've really loved learning off him so far and I know the girls have as well. And it's just a really good vibe around the group. And that's, you know, part to do with him as well, coming in and driving that and um, those elite standards and wanting us to be better. So he's been awesome. You talked about this in the piece today with Lauren. It's in the Herald Sun, Lauren Wood's story in the Herald Sun. You talked about the fact that there was, you know, there was speculation that maybe you wouldn't be part of, with yeah. the two new clubs coming in and pressure on to stay. And we know they've made a you know, really big impact on lists around the AFLW. Did, had you made up your mind to stay before half had arrived at the football club? Was his arrival, did that coincide with you crystallising your decision to stay at Carl? No, so not necessarily at the time. I think when I had um, basically sort of, obviously the article came out and I made it clear that I was staying. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm not even sure yet if half was actually appointed. Okay, so right. yep. um, it didn't necessarily have a huge deal with that. But um, when I heard he was coming across, I was excited. I knew... Um, a few of the Collingwood girls um, that he obviously had in the previous year um, and they had nothing but great things to say about him, um, you know, how, how much he drives the group and how sort of inspirational he was for the girls. So um, for me, I was just really pumped to have him in. But um, no, at the time, as I said, when I sort of um, had, had made it clear that I was staying at Carlton, I don't even think half was appointed mm. yet. Could mm. be wrong, but I'm, I'm certain he wasn't yet. So, yeah. And is he asking your group to play a... You know, kind of distinctly different style of football than you've been used to playing after uh, uh, in the first couple of years yeah. in, the, in the competition. I think, yeah. I, look, I think half just wants us to be a really attacking group and um, to be brave and and just and you know, sort of go for it, mm. um, play through the guts, sort of sort of footy. Um, so for us, that's probably been a bit different to the past. I mean, we sort of got criticised a fair bit last year for being defensive and. I don't necessarily think that was our game plan, but I think it sort of happened by default. Um, we we had obviously a few areas to improve um, in terms of getting first use to the footy and actually being able to get it to our outside runners and that sort of thing. So we obviously didn't manage to do that to the best of our ability. Um, and I think that hurt us a bit. And then we ended up being pretty defensive mm. because of that. Mm. So I think, um, you know, going into this next season, like I said, half is wanting us to be really brave and take chances and really sort of, um, you know, attack as much as we yep, can. So yep, that yep. I think that's where he comes from. You're a cross-coder. How, how do, the transition from round ball football to oval ball football, I know you'd kick the footy around as a, a younger girl, but was that, a, was that an easy transition for you to make? Um, oh, sort of to an extent. I mean, like you mentioned, I played up until under 12s with the boys. So um, I sort of had a bit to do with AFL. And to be honest, it was the sport I wanted to play for my right. whole life. Yep. It was always my number one. So the only reason I swapped out of footy um, was probably like a lot of girls' stories is that there was no pathway and there was no opportunity. And for me, it, even being a really little girl, I wanted to be a professional and I wanted to be elite. And I knew that wasn't and op- there was no opportunity in the AFL. So that's when I went to the soccer and um, it was interesting to start with. I started off as a midfielder and quickly I think they realised I could use my hands coming from a sort of AFL background. So they, they sort of chucked me in goals and then from there that's yeah. when I became a goalkeeper. So coming back, the hardest bit was probably, as you can imagine, the running aspect as a goalkeeper. I tried to run as much as I could outside of training, but everything was explosive sort of, yeah, of course. that short, sharp stuff. So for me, that was the hardest bit. But um, in terms of being able to read the play, I was always sort of seeing the game in front of me as a goalkeeper. And I think that's why I transitioned pretty quickly into a center half back, being able to see everything in front of me and sort of direct girls. So um, there was definitely things that helped me to transition back to footy. Is as that well. something you still lo- Is that where you think and feel you fit Best? Is that where you think you're going to be used again? If you, I don't know whether you've had conversations with the coaching staff yep. about that, but do you think that's going to be your kind of role again? Yeah, I think I think we'll see. I mean, it naturally playing in the back line probably is my most natural position. Yep. Um, but obviously, I'm, I mean, I've only been back in the game for about three years now, so I've still got a lot of learning to do. And 
every single sport I've played, even as a youngster playing footy, I was always very defensive. So even in the midfield, as a kid when I played in the midfield, I was I was a bit defensive minded. Yeah, so right, for yeah. me, um, if if I am going to sort of play a more attacking position this year, I'll sort of have to just sort of change that mindset. But um, yeah, I think for half, he'll probably want to have as many versatile players as he can. So I'll try and learn some other positions as well, not just backline, see where I end up.